Uh, hello everybody, uh, my name is Alice Robinson. I'm the resident judge of Croydon Crown Court and the honorary recorder of Croydon. Um, as you may know, if you practice in the criminal field, uh, Croydon has been one of the courts which has remained open throughout the pandemic. It's been quite a challenge, uh, both for the uh, members of staff and judges. Uh, but we seem to have um, managed to get through it. Uh, we all became um, very familiar with technology pretty swiftly after lockdown and we've managed to keep uh, all our non-trial work going uh, throughout the lockdown. Uh, we started jury trials uh, three weeks ago now and so we've got some experience of conducting those uh, under the new uh, social distancing regime. Um, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be with uh, my friend and colleague Lana Wood this afternoon. Uh, Lana is um, a circuit judge at Harrow Crown Court. Uh, she's very experienced and um, I'm uh, very pleased to say that uh, when the Coronavirus Act was passed, uh, Lana uh, looked into it uh, swiftly and thoroughly and uh, since then she has been educating the rest of the judiciary as to what it actually means. So she really is um, the person who knows all about it. Uh, so thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I hope you find it uh, useful. Uh, we will take questions at the end and um, if you look at the bottom of your screen there's a Q&A uh, icon and if you click on that uh, you can write your questions in there. And what we'll do is we'll make a note of them and uh, we'll come to them at the end if we may. Uh, we've got a PowerPoint presentation uh, that uh, I'm going to ask Tony Charles to put up now. Thank you. Um, and uh, Lana's going to speak to the first half of it and I'm going to speak to the second half of it. So thank you very much and uh, over to you Lana. Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you about the law um, and then Alice will talk to you about the practicalities. Um, so Tony, if we can move the slides on um, for a couple of slides. The first one just says the law um, and, and then we get to the meat of the matter. We've lost the slides at the moment. There we go. Thank you. <clears throat> Good. So, um, lovely. Thank you. Uh, a quick revision of the provisions that we um, were in force before the Coronavirus Act was passed that enabled the Crown Court to order um, attendance by live link. Um, so we had power under the Criminal Justice Act to um, permit people who were abroad to give evidence through a, a live link. Um, the special measures directions um, for witnesses um, under the Youth Justice and Criminal Evidence Act and defendants evidence directions for young and vulnerable defendants um, under the same act. Under the Crime and Disorder Act um, we had powers to order um, defendants in custody to attend preliminary hearings and sentencing hearings by live link. And under the Criminal Justice Act, um, Section 51, there was a more general um, power to order live link directions for witnesses other than the defendant. If we move on to the next slide, we'll see how things have changed. So the Coronavirus Act went through Parliament, I think in about 72 hours flat. Um, I was in a very good position to look at it because I'd been signed off work as self-isolating. Um, and I realised um, that it was going to make a massive difference um, to what um, my colleagues and I could achieve um, during lockdown. Um, so the way the Act works is that it makes temporary modifications to existing legislation and those um, modifications came into force on the 25th of March and are going to expire at the end of the period of two years beginning with that date um, unless they're revoked earlier than that. We move on to the next slide, we can see how the powers have been extended. So the court's now got very wide powers, a power to permit any person taking part in certain proceedings to attend by live link. So those powers we had under the um, Crime and Disorder Act 
have now been extended um, to include a power to um, direct any person taking part in either a preliminary hearing or a sentencing hearing to attend by live link. Um, that power under Section 51 of the Criminal Justice Act to make a live link direction has been extended um, to include a power to direct any person taking part in eligible criminal proceedings um, to take part by live link um, except the jury. If we move on, we can see what a live link direction is. So <clears throat> live link was um, defined under the previous legislation, but has re been redefined uh, under the modified legislation and is in identical terms in the modified version of the Crime Disorder Act and in the Criminal Justice Act. There are two types of live link um, under the legislation, either a live audio link um, or a live video link. So a live audio link we would all recognise as being in effect a, a telephone conference call. It's um, a, an arrangement which allows a person taking part in a hearing um, to hear all other people taking part in the hearing who aren't in the same location as they are and enables all those other people taking part in the hearing <coughs> not in the same uh, location as P to hear P. A hearing is conducted wholly as an audio hearing if directions have been given for everybody to take part through live audio link and all of those people do take part in the hearing in accordance with those directions. If we move over to the next slide, we can see that live video link is similar. Um, so a live video link in relation to somebody taking part in a hearing is a TV link um, or other arrangement which enables that person to see and hear everyone else taking part in the hearing who isn't in the same location as they are and all those other people to see and hear P. This is the provision um, that has caused us some difficulty in practice um, because you may have seen our prison video link facilities in court um, and our live link facilities um, prior to the Coronavirus Act, each had a fixed camera on the clerk's desk, um, which was capable of focusing on the judge, on the clerk, on um, defence advocate, on um, the uh, prosecution advocate, but isn't really very good at giving a picture of everybody um, in the hearing who is not in the same location as um, the person perhaps giving evidence from a remote location. Um, <clears throat> a hearing is conducted wholly as a video hearing, um, similarly as with audio hearing, if directions have been given for everybody to take part through a live video link and all of those persons do take part in the hearing in accordance with those directions. So the difficulty I mentioned um, has recently been um, considered by Mr Justice Edis um, and Alice will talk about um, the pragmatic solution you may think that he's arrived at in relation um, to those provisions. We move on then next to the next slide. So um, the first question that I'm going to address, the substantive question, is um, whether the court has power to make a live link direction. Um, and the important thing to understand here, if we move over the page, are the three key concepts um, in the modified provisions, um, preliminary hearing, sentencing hearing, and eligible criminal proceedings. Each of those is defined um, in the legislation. If the hearing you are concerned with doesn't fit within the bounds of one of those definitions, um, then um, subject to the pre-existing powers, there are no um, extended powers to order anybody to, ex to attend by live link. So let's have a quick look at those definitions then. Um, if we move over the page, we've uh, got the statutory definition of preliminary hearing. This, I think, is probably pretty much what you'd expect. It's a hearing um, in the proceedings held before the start of the trial. So any PTPH, any mention hearing, um, those types of hearings, and it's uh, extended by the wording to include preparatory hearings under those two statutory provisions. If we move over to sentencing hearing, that perhaps is wider than you might have expected, as well as including any hearing following conviction um, to sentence an offender or determine how the court should deal with him. It also includes hearings determining how the offender has complied with the sentence and how the offender should be dealt with in respect of compliance. So what we'd normally think of um, as breach proceedings. 
Um, eligible criminal proceedings defined um, in the Criminal Justice Act, if we turn over to the next slide, <clears throat> is um, defined completely differently. So rather than there being um, a, a statutory definition as there is for preliminary hearing and sentencing hearing, there is simply a list of types of proceedings which are eligible criminal proceedings. Um, I've set them out in this slide and over the next page into the next slide, you'll see looking at this page, um, at, well, looking at both pages, jury trials uh, are potentially um, eligible criminal proceedings, for instance, appeals, um, are eligible criminal proceedings, for instance. So again, quite a wide definition, but note the um, passage in bold at the bottom, the two sets of definitions are mutually exclusive. Hearings to which part 3A of the Crime and Disorder Act applies are not eligible criminal proceedings. So if, it, if a hearing is a sentencing hearing or a preliminary hearing, even if it otherwise appears to fall within one of those um, hearings mentioned in the list, um, it isn't going to be eligible criminal proceedings. So moving on then um, to the powers um, that are granted in the Act. So section 57b in relation to preliminary hearings and section 57e in relation to sentencing hearings give the court power to require or permit any person taking part in that hearing to participate by audio or video link. Those powers are enormously wide. They include a power to give a direction for a judge or a, a magistrate to take part in a preliminary or sentencing hearing through live link. Um, so I've been doing hearings um, from um, my study, which I'm in at the moment. You can see my robes on the door behind me, um, ready to go, um, rather than going physically into the court building. So Alice mentioned that Croydon was open um, throughout lockdown. Um, at Harrow, um, we lost so many of our staff to illness and um, self-isolation that we weren't able to continue functioning. We operated one remote court from Isleworth Crown Court, who kindly let us squat with them, but a lot of our hearings were done by judges um, from their own homes. Um, a direction can be given that applies to several or all of the people participating in the hearing. Um, I, a direction can be nuanced, so it can be applied to a particular person in respect of some only aspects, only some aspects um, of a particular hearing. So you could, for instance, give um, a direction um, in relation to whether somebody needs to attend while they're giving evidence, um, but maybe they could attend by live link when not giving evidence. Um, the power also extends to uh, a power to give a direction for somebody who is outside England and Wales. Um, so that power I mentioned under the Criminal Justice Act has been temporarily suspended while these powers are in force. Um, the, uh, if we turn over to the next slide, you'll see that um, the powers are um, subject to the prohibitions and limitations contained in Schedule 3A. One of my irritations in working my way through these modified provisions has been that the new schedule inserted both into the Crime and Disorder Act and, and into the Criminal Justice Act is Schedule 3A. So if you've printed them out, you need to make sure that you keep them nice and separate and you know which one applies to which act. My suggestion, for what it's worth, is that the best place to look at the legislation is on Westlaw, um, because on Westlaw you get the unmodified legislation and then underneath it the temporarily modified legislation so you can find it all quite easily. The prohibitions and limitations applicable to preliminary hearings are in part one of Schedule 3A to the Crime and Disorder Act and those applicable to sentencing hearings are in part two um, of Schedule 3A. So um, turning over the slide there are a number of um, limitations and prohibitions which are applicable to all preliminary hearings. Um, so a defendant can't take part in a preliminary hearing through live audio link for the purpose of giving evidence and a person other than the defendant can't take part in a preliminary or sentencing hearing through a live audio link for the purpose of giving evidence unless there are no suitable arrangements by means of which that person could give evidence through a live link and the parties agree to that person giving evidence through live link. If we turn over the next slide, you'll see that there are specific limitations and prohibitions which apply to particular types of preliminary hearings. Um, so a bail hearing at which um, whether bail should be granted or not is disputed, um, fitness to plead hearings, 
hearings at which a guilty plea will be accepted by the court and any hearing involving contempt of court. So if you get a preliminary hearing that falls into one of those categories, you need to look up um, the specific um, limitations uh, relevant to those hearings. Um, moving over the slide, um, there are limitations and prohibitions which apply to all sentencing hearing. Um, you'll see they're pretty much similar to those that apply to preliminary hearings. Um, one difference. So again, the defendant can't take part through a live audio link. Um, and again, a person other than the defendant can't take part for the purpose of giving evidence unless you can't make suitable arrangements um, to give evidence um, through live video link and the parties agree. Um, one further prohibition in relation to sentencing hearing, um, a person other than a defendant may not take part in a sentencing hearing through a live audio link unless that person's participation is only for the purpose of giving evidence. That's been giving us practical problems when we've had technical difficulties with Skype um, video hearings, for instance, um, uh, or people's video cameras on their laptops haven't been operating. Um, in theory, if we can only get sound and not picture, that invalidates um, a sentencing hearing. Moving um, over the slide, uh, and we'll have a look at um, the powers under the Criminal Justice Act in relation to eligible criminal proceedings. So similarly wide powers, um, power to give a direction applicable to several or all of the people taking part in eligible criminal proceedings, um, applicable to a particular person in respect to some aspects um, of the proceedings, and also um, extending to those outside the jurisdiction and similarly, in relation to, uh, as in relation to preliminary and sentencing hearings, um, they include the power to give a direction for a judge or justice to take part via um, live link. Um, as I mentioned, if we turn over the slide, you'll see that the prohibitions and limitations um, on the powers in section 51 um, are similarly contained in Schedule 3A, although this time Schedule 3A to the Criminal Justice Act 2003. Again, um, similarly as uh, in the case of the definitions, um, the approach taken by the draftsman in these modifications is completely different um, to the modifications to the, to the Crime Disorder Act. So the way this works is proceedings may only be conducted wholly as audio proceedings if they meet the conditions set out in paragraph one. Um, and um, proceedings may only be conducted wholly as video proceedings if they meet the conditions set out in paragraph two. And if you look at those paragraphs, you will see in each case that the conditions are that the hearing is a particular type of hearing. So similarly to the definition of eligible criminal proceedings, you just get a list of types of proceedings. So um, these proceedings meet the condition in paragraph one, and then they're all listed. Paragraph three contains additional restrictions on the use of audio links um, for hearings which meet the conditions set out in paragraph one. And paragraph four contains additional restrictions. Those apply both to proceedings um, which um, meet the conditions set out in paragraph two and to those types of uh, proceedings which meet neither the conditions set out in paragraph one nor in paragraph two. <clears throat> um, moving on then uh, to restrictions. So the major restriction is, is the one contained in the body of the statute itself, um, section 51, subsection 1BB. No direction may be given for any member of a jury to take part in eligible criminal proceedings through audio or video link. But there are additional restrictions um, similar to those that apply to preliminary and sentencing hearings. So again, the defendant may not take part in the proceedings through live audio link for the purpose of giving evidence and um, a person other than the defendant um, can't take part in the proceedings through live audio link for the purpose of giving evidence unless there are no suitable arrangements for video link and the parties agree. So then uh, turning over the slide to our second question, um, when is the court going to consider making a live link direction? So um, on the following slide, you'll see that um, the criminal procedure rules have been temporarily modified as well to accommodate the modifications to the legislation. Um, I've been attending a um, trial and case management court course run by the Judicial College 
um, today, uh, of which um, the very clear message um, being promulgated is the criminal procedure rules and the criminal practice directions are the law. They are there to help you. You should consult them in relation to everything you do. Um, so I commend the same approach to you. Um, criminal Procedure Rule 18 sets out the procedure for making an application. Um, it also contains a whole load of really useful notes that set out the law. Um, so that's where I would start if I were making an application. Um, the court has the power of its own motion to make a live link direction. Um, the court may decide the hearing, uh, may decide um, to give a live link direction at a hearing. Um, or conversely may decide um, to give a live link direction without a hearing. If the court does hold a hearing to consider whether to make a live link direction, then the court has the power to require or permit anybody to take part in that hearing um, remotely. Moving over to the next slide, <clears throat> um, these are the preconditions to making a, a live link direction. Um, if we look at B and C first, um, it's a requirement that um, parties have had the opportunity to make representations and that if um, the defendant is under 18 or is being treated um, as if he's under 18, the relevant youth offending team has been given the opportunity to make representations. A is really the overarching test. Um, the live link direction can only be made if the court is satisfied that it's in the interests of justice for the person concerned to take part in the proceedings um, through a live link. Um, moving over then to the next question. So what criteria is the court going to apply um, when deciding whether to make a live link direction? So I've mentioned um, the big question, is making a live link direction in the interests of justice? Um, but if we turn over the slide, we'll see that there are there's assistance really for the court um, in determining that question. So the court must consider all the circumstances of the case and then there's a list of things that the court ought to look at in particular. So in the case of a direction relating to a witness, the importance of the witness's evidence to the hearing or proceedings and whether a direction might tend to inhibit any party from effectively testing the witness's evidence. Um, over the page, in the case of a direction relating to any participant in the hearing, um, the availability of that person, the need for that person to attend in person, that person's views, um, the suitability of the facilities uh, at the place where that person would take part in the hearing in accordance with the live link direction, and whether the person will be able to take part in the hearing effectively if he or she takes part in accordance with the live link direction. So that's all the um, legal background. Um, we've spent a huge amount of time and energy, I think, as judges, working out the practicalities of how we can manage um, our proceedings in, uh, first of all, lockdown times and, and now socially distanced times. Um, and Alice is going to talk to you about some of the solutions um, that we've found. Yes, solutions and problems. <laughs> Thank you, Lana, very much. Um, Yes, so moving on to the practicalities, um, if we could have the next slide, please, Tony. Um, what technology is the Crown Court using to keep hearings going? Well, telephone hearings, that, those aren't new. I think um, they um, have, we've been conducting telephone hearings for uh, pre-trial matters for some time, uh, but these are new, Skype hearings, video, sorry, cloud video platform hearings and hybrid hearings. And I'll explain what I mean by those in a minute. So if we could move on, um, please. Uh, first of all, to telephone hearings. And um, those are particularly useful um, for uncontested hearings. For example, if the Crown are going to offer no evidence uh, or it's a bail application or variation. Um, they're also, I find them very useful for case management hearings uh, because you can ask uh, both trial counsel to dial in, as solicitors on both sides and the officer in the case. So you've got uh, everybody involved in the hearing in the same virtual room, as it were, um, to be able to thrash out any issues. And uh, for the purposes of getting cases ready for trial, I've been ordering pre-trial reviews in all of them on this basis. And um, I found it extremely helpful. Uh, you can also have a telephone hearing um, to extend the custody time limit 
uh, whether it's contested or not. But I do just um, put down a word of caution that uh, the criminal procedure rules uh, have a requirement that the defend has a right, defendant has a right to attend uh, an application to extend the custody time limit unless that is waived. So that um, unless it's uncontested, um, quite often um, the parties will want the defendant to attend, so it can't be conducted by phone, it has to be conducted by video hearing. Um, telephone hearings are less suitable if the defendant's attendance is required. Uh, obviously, if the defendant's in custody, it's impractical, but defendants on bail in theory could join a telephone conference. Um, but there is no provision for the defendant and their legal uh, representative to have a private conversation. They effectively have to hang up and phone each other and then dial back in again, which is um, a bit clunky. So moving on, if I may, to Skype hearings. Um, the, this is what we were using to start with because the cloud video platform, which I'll come on to next, hadn't been fully developed. And um, I think it's fair to say that uh, we managed to get quite a lot of work done using Skype, but it was a, a real challenge because um, the technology was new to uh, all of the staff and most of the judges. Um, and uh, it proved particularly difficult where defendants are in custody. Um, they can't directly participate in a Skype hearing. And so what I've described as a workaround was required um, which took us a great deal of time to understand and set up so that it was effective uh, in every hearing. And, and what it basically involved was um, getting a defendant on the normal prison video link and then setting up two screens in court, one with the defendant on the video link facing another screen which showed the Skype call uh, so that the defendant could be seen on the Skype call in order to comply with the requirement of the legislation that if a video link direction is given, uh, the person attending by video link can hear and see all of the other participants and the, all the other participants can hear and see the person on the video link. And we also found that the technology was uh, not so reliable. It's um, uh, not, not um, a platform which has been specifically designed for court hearings and so if it goes down for some reason there's nothing you can do about it. Um, while it is, is useful um, it has limitations for example the number of people who are visible at any one time on the screen is limited and if somebody isn't speaking or hasn't spoken for a while then their photograph drops off uh, to the bottom of the screen um, and that's um, not useful for um, court hearings, really, because the defendant isn't going to be speaking. Um, but that's somebody you want to be able to see. Um, uh, but that often resulted in the defendant um, well, not being visible, again, with potentially the problem that it didn't comply with the legislation, but everybody could see and hear everyone else. Um, uh, for those of you working from home without appropriate backgrounds, uh, there's no facility to alter the background on Skype. Um, so moving on, if I may, to the cloud video platform. that This is, had been in existence for some time. It developed for the um, purposes of um, the justice system, uh, but it wasn't uh, ready for rollout in the Crown Court um, for some time. Um, it has been now. Uh, we at Croydon are using a CVP all the time now. We're not using Skype at all anymore because CVP is so much better. Um, it was a bit slow to get going even once they got the technology up and running because it was dependent on uh, a license being granted. So when we started at Croydon, we only had two licenses. I'm pleased to say that we've now got the same number of licenses as we have courtrooms, which is eight. Um, it also has a facility for pre and post hearing conferences uh, with defendants uh, using a different link. So if you've got a defendant in custody, the prison will set up a link which is notified to the court. The court will notify the parties either by emailing them or putting it 
the link in a widely shared comment on the right hand side of the digital case system and uh, with the time and counsel can then dial into that separate link and have a private conference with the defendant before the met the hearing which has a separate um, uh, link and afterwards as well um, technical support is available because it's been specifically designed for um, the justice system uh, if there are problems um, then you can get in touch with somebody who will hopefully help um, the next point uh, it is a significant advantage to the um, point I made earlier about Skype hearings the uh, cloud video the CVP system uh, has two types of participant a host and a guest uh, the host will normally be the clerk who's the person who sets the hearing up uh, but it can also be the judge um, and the person with host uh, powers can pin somebody's picture so that it always appears at the top of the screen rather than being lost over time when somebody doesn't say anything so you can pin the defendant screen uh, to the to window to the top of the screen which means that um, everyone can see the defendant all the time throughout the hearing um, if you're going to use uh, CVP it's important to use Google Chrome as your browser and um, if you're at court to use um, the Gov Wi-Fi and experience has shown that if you use a different browser from Google Chrome uh, you're likely to have problems audio and video problems and the Gov Wi-Fi uh, provides a good um, Wi-Fi for the purpose of um, uh, ensuring effective hearings um, so moving on if we may to um, hybrid hearings now uh, this is this has is not a term of art it's just a phrase that, uh, that people have um, started using to describe hearings that involve some people being present in the courtroom and some people being present um, by a live link normally a video link um, now this is personal opinion not everybody agrees with this but uh, i think they are to be avoided at all costs uh, because they require a workaround which is similar to that used for skype when defendants are in custody so you heard lana explain earlier about the camera in court um, not being a particularly flexible tool not showing um, that many people um, in order to have a valid um, hybrid hearing with somebody attending remotely you've got to uh, arrange everybody in court and the camera in court so that uh, everybody in court can see the person on the CVP on the television screens in court but everybody on CVP or Skype can see everybody in the courtroom as well um, uh, and that really is the second point on the slide that those att attending remotely have more limited vis visibility of those physically present and uh, a slightly different point in my opinion um, they're particularly inappropriate for sentencing a defendant should have a clear view of all participants uh, and likewise a victim who may be attending to read their victim personal statement and i think i can say that um, it, it's a, a pretty um, consistent view across the judiciary um, that if you're sentencing a defendant particularly if you're sentencing a defendant to custody um, everybody should be in the room. Um, it's, a, it's a serious business and important. Now, one of the questions uh, before uh, during Lana's part of the uh, slides was how challenging have been the live link hearings? So if we move on to the next slide, I think we've anticipated your question to some extent. Uh, Tony, oh, we seem to have lost the slides. Let's just hang on a moment till we get the challenges slide up. Uh, if it helps, it's slide 34. Yes, here we go. So, um, 
the oh, we've gone back uh, yeah challenges sorry um the 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 first thing I would say is that if you have any particular wish to uh, for a hearing to take place remotely or in person, then you need to source it out in advance. Um, check if a court has a policy uh, as to which hearings are going to be remote and which will be in person. Uh, Harrow Crown Court, where Lana sits, is very organised and they have a, a written policy that uh, is available and uploaded, so everybody knows what it is. Um, uh, but you can still ask the court what's, how they propose to deal with the hearing, even if they don't have a written policy, um, and make representations in advance, um, because it's quite disruptive if um, everybody's expecting a hearing to take place in one way, and then when the list, final list comes out at four o'clock in the afternoon, um, it's different, and it's, uh, may be, it may not be easy to uh, change things at that stage. Uh, the next point is you must have a reliable Wi-Fi connection. Um, one of the big challenges uh, that we have found conducting hearings by video link is that many of the participants are at home and some of them have much better Wi-Fi than others. And if the Wi-Fi isn't very good, um, it, it means that they cut out. Uh, hearings take much longer. Uh, it's really very difficult. And uh, a related point is the next one. You must be completely familiar with the audio and vi video functions of your device. Uh, I've lost count of the number of times um, that I've wasted a um, quarter of an hour up to half an hour uh, in remote hearings, waiting for one of the advocates to sort out their um, video, their um, camera on their device, or their uh, microphone. Uh, I, uh, I could understand it at the beginning of lockdown, it was new to everybody, but uh, some people are having these problems even today. Um, be sensible about the background that people see. Um, if you're uh, at home, then um, you may not necessarily want everybody to see um, what sort of type of art you have on your walls or what books you've been reading so just be aware of what's going to be behind you and um, you need to be in a quiet and private place uh, one of my colleagues said uh, that they were conducting a, a hearing by video link and uh, halfway through it um, one of the advocate screens uh, a small child ran naked behind them across the screen <laughs> So um, if, you're, if you're at home, uh, you know, you need to, as Lana is, be in your study, shut the door. Um, another very important point is uh, that you should mute your microphone when you're not speaking, because um, uh, if you don't, people can hear absolutely everything. Now, I've printed out a copy of the uh, PowerPoint that we're going through. So if I do this, you, I'm sure you can all hear it's very irritating. Um, papers shuffling around. Uh, another very important point, it is just as it's um, unlawful to take a photograph or record uh, proceedings in court, uh, the unauthorised recording or transmission of any image or sound on a live link is an offence, and that's section 85c of the 2003 Courts Act. Um, so that's uh, live link. Uh, for um, preliminary and sentencing hearings. I'm going to move on now, if I may, to jury trials in socially distanced time. And um, th this photograph is particularly apposite. Uh, my court services manager now has a tape measure permanently attached to her waistband uh, so that when she's going around the courtroom, she can measure out uh, and ensure that everybody's two metres apart. Uh, and hazard tape is absolutely everywhere uh, because, for example, um, seats which shouldn't be used have been taped off. Um, so moving on to the next slide, please, uh, Tony. Uh, how does it ha actually happen in practice? Well, um, obviously it varies depending on the size of the courtroom and they do vary enormously. Uh, at Croydon, we have 
some bigger courtrooms, but they're not enormous. And in order for us to conduct a jury trial with everybody two metres apart, we have to use three courtrooms. So one courtroom is for the trial court participants, the judge, the clerk, the jury, counsel, and the usher. Uh, we have another court, which is an overflow court for the press and public. And if there are solicitors or junior counsel who can't fit into the trial court, that's where they'll be. And the proceedings in the trial court are relayed into the overflow court using the um, court video link. And then we have a third courtroom, which is for the jury because, and I think this is the case for everybody, the jury retiring rooms are simply not big enough uh, for um, 12 people to sit two metres apart. So the jury have to use a separate courtroom as their jury retiring room. Um, how do we impanel the jury? Well, that, that has been quite a logistical problem, um, especially with larger panels. Um, on Monday, uh, we started a murder trial at Croydon, um, which is going to go on for three or four weeks. And uh, we had a jury panel of, um, I think, 38, uh, which was far too many people to get into one room. And so we had to have them in two separate courtrooms. Um, and uh, the judge um, left the trial courtroom and went into the courtroom where the jury were and addressed them uh, to um, deal with uh, explaining the trial arrangements during um, the pandemic, but also to ask the standard questions that we're all familiar with uh, about whether they uh, would know anybody involved in the case, uh, description, very brief description of the incident, address, date and so on, to see if anybody knows anything about the case. Um, and then the judge has to repeat all that again in the other courtroom. With a smaller panel and a shorter case, some courtrooms we have, uh, so we started in another court, we've now got two courtrooms running jury trials and the other one that started on Monday, we had a panel of 15 and there was enough room in the trial court for all of them, to, all the panel to go into the courtroom and for those sort of questions to be asked in the usual way. Um, and if the, if the jury panel are in a different courtroom, then we have the clerk in the trial courtroom, uh, shuffle the cards as usual, call out the jurors' names. They would be, the clerk would be on the telephone to the usher in the other courtroom and the, we would read out the name and that person would then walk down the corridor into the um, trial courtroom and take their seat. Uh, the courts have been laid out in such a way as to reduce the movement of people within the courtroom uh, and requires participants to stick to their own seat. So, for example, for jurors, uh, every seat has got a number from 1 to 12. And uh, when you're selected as juror number one, for example, then uh, that is the seat that you stay on for the rest of the case. And there in the jury retiring court, there are uh, numbers on all the seats as well so you know that's your seat when you go back to the, the retiring courtroom and that means that uh, there's less uh, people are almost in their own little cocoon other people aren't touching um, the same surfaces as they are um, and, and the way that the numbers have been laid out in court means that um, the from 1 to 12 the jurors don't uh, pass close to each other but that also means that when the jury leave the courtroom, they leave in reverse order. So jury number 12 would leave first and 11, 10. And that way there's a smooth um, movement of them in and out of court, not crossing each other's paths or being close to each other. Now, again, it varies from courtroom to courtroom, but at Croydon, um, the getting 12 jurors into a court two metres apart means that they are spread all around the courtroom and uh, for that reason, uh, when the um, advocates address them, uh, opening closing speeches, uh, they uh, would be, a lot of the jurors would be behind them if they were in their normal position on the advocates bench. So they uh, come in front of the bench and turn around so they've uh, got their side on to the judge and facing the rest of the courtroom. 
uh, either in front of council's bench or in the witness box. Um, special measures have been a bit of a challenge, but we have are now worked out how to how to deal with them. If a witness wants to give evidence behind a screen, the normal arrangement is that the screen goes around the witness box. Obviously, if you've got jurors spread around the courtroom, that isn't going to work because the jurors won't be able to see them. Um, we did experiments briefly with uh, having a very narrow screen in front of the witness box so that the a defendant sitting in a specific seat in the dock couldn't see the witness and vice versa but that wasn't very satisfactory because the witness only needed to move a few inches before they um, could be seen so what we've done is uh, we have a portable screen that is placed in front of the dock so between the dock and the last row of councils and solicitors benches and um, the uh, Dock is screened while the witness comes into court in such a way that the defendant can't see the witness. The screen's then pulled back a bit so that uh, the defendant can't see the witness and vice versa, but all of the jurors in court can see the witness, um, as can counsel and the judge. And in fact, um, it's much easier for counsel because they don't have to, you know, squeeze down one end of the bench to look round the screen that would have been around the witness box. And uh, obviously, witnesses can give evidence by video link in the same way that they would have done before uh, children, um, for example. Um, the only thing that you do need to bear in mind uh, if witnesses giving evidence by video link is the overflow courtroom. And you have to temporarily cut the picture to the overflow courtroom while the witness is being brought into court. Uh, otherwise, all the public gallery can see them. And when the witness is in the witness box, the camera in the trial court has to be um, pointed in such a way that uh, they can't see the witness. So that's the courtroom itself. If we move on to the next slide, um, I'm dealing with documents. Oh, I lost it again. Thank you. Um, now, uh, uh, it's not uh, sensible to conduct trials in the way that we used to, where there was a lot of toing and froing with the jury uh, while um, matters were agreed, for example, edits of the defence interview that would then be handed round. The jury bundle has to be agreed well in advance uh, so that um, that process of the jury coming in and out is uh, reduced to an absolute minimum because it's extremely time consuming and also um, it enables the bundle and the indictment to be provided 72 hours in advance of the trial which uh, minimizes the transmission of infection. Um, it's inevitable some documents will be created during the trial for example the judge's legal directions uh, but those are not to be just handed around. Um, they documents should be provided to the usher who will put them on the jurors a seat or desk when the jury are out of the courtroom uh, because that uh, again minimizes the movement of people uh, and the num uh, their proximity and the number of people handling 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 a document um, to keep uh, documents to a minimum uh, where possible material should be shown on click share and recorded on a data capture device so the jury can view it in retirement now, the next slide, please, is about whether people attend in person or remotely. And uh, one of the other questions that was asked during Lana's half of the talk was, what, are the challenge, what is the challenge of conducting jury trial online? Well, um, the uh, advice from the senior judiciary and um, it, the, I think the views of myself and my colleagues is that jury trials should be conducted in person. Um, it is possible for video link directions to be made in respect of participants other than the jury um, but uh, unless there's some overriding reason why somebody can't attend in person then um, it's better however um, there are issues uh, dealing with defendants first of all 
Uh, many docks are not big enough uh, for um, multi-handed cases. Uh, for example, we have um, the two trial courts we're running at the moment. The dock is only big enough for two people, so that's one defendant and one dock officer. So we've not done any multi-handed cases yet. Uh, we have just had some physical alterations done to a different courtroom, uh, which will enable us to conduct. Um, and it's got a bigger dock, so we can have two defendants and two dock officers. Um, but it's going to be virtually impossible to conduct uh, multi-handed cases with more than two defendants um, unless there's a change in the application of social distancing in courtrooms. So uh, what are the uh, workarounds that have been identified? Well, one of them is the defendant could attend by a video link. That has happened in a number of cases. Um, Mr Justice Edis is conducting a case at the um, Central Criminal Court at the moment where he's got three Category A prisoners who are all attending uh, by video link and um, he's, uh, he gave a judgment recently about um, the proper construction of the live link um, provisions which I'll come to in a moment. Um, uh, another possibility is that uh, the defendants could be in the dock in the overflow court now that hasn't happened yet in any case that I'm aware of, uh, but it's certainly something that is being given serious consideration um, at all levels um, in order to get multi-handed cases on. Um, and what about witnesses? Well, uh, you may have witnesses with COVID-19 issues which prevent them from attending trial. And in theory, there's no reason why they couldn't give evidence by video link in the same way that, for example, a child would who was brought to court and was giving evidence by video link from the link room in the court building. But there are some practical issues that do need to be considered. Um, can the witness be supervised by a police officer? Uh, if not, how is the integrity of the witness's evidence to be preserved? Um, different people have different views. Uh, it would be possible, for example, at the beginning of the witness's evidence to invite the witness to move their device, uh, the camera on it, around the room so that you could see that they were in the room on their own. Um, but uh, as normally the case, the person is in front of a screen and the screen doesn't show the rest of the room for most of the time and there'd be nothing to stop someone else coming into the room and not being seen while the witness is on video link and um, which uh, you know on a on a sort of um, on a serious level could involve um, somebody uh, coaching them interfering with their evidence uh, but even on a, a more minor level if it was a child who came into the room for example um, it could prove distracting to the witness uh, we're encouraging pre-trial visits for witnesses um, to uh, show them all the arrangements that we've got in place uh, which will hopefully assuage any concerns that they have because they'll see how the court has been laid out not just in the courtrooms but throughout the public areas to ensure social distancing and the enhanced cleaning regime that we have uh, whereby uh, cleaners go around and clean all of the main public surfaces every two hours it's like a sort of painting the fourth bridge analogy going on all the time um, and the other thing that needs to be considered is the technology so um, if a witness is going to give evidence by video link either from the court or another location and your courtroom is not big enough for members of the public so that you've got a, an overflow courtroom where the um, trial court proceedings are relayed the court's video link can't it the, the uh, technology doesn't allow you to show two things at once so that uh, the whole exercise has to be conducted by CVP in other words the witness has to be on CVP and the um, overflow court is also um, set up using CVP let's have the next slide please um, so this is Mr Justice Edis's case at the Old Bailey and I see we've got to six o'clock but um, this is the last topic uh, so um, uh, we'll, we'll finish quite shortly and have any more questions. Um, it, as I said it's a three-handed trial, uh, category A prisoners, 
um, who are in Belmarsh, and Belmarsh's policy is not to produce defend category A defendants at court, other than for jury impanelment and the defend defendant's own case. And so uh, the proposal was that they would attend the trial uh, at all other times via a live link from the prison's virtual court. Now that would enable the defendants to hear the proceedings and they would have a view of the courtroom and of the person who was speaking. And um, they could be seen and heard and uh, be able to attract attention if uh, that was necessary. And there were facilities for private conferences before and after the trial uh, during the day. Um, but the defence argued that that wasn't fair and uh, they should be produced in person. So if we go to the next slide, um, uh, this rather left the judge in a very difficult position. Um, social distancing meant multi-handed cases could only be tried with the defendants appearing by a uh, live link because even the largest docks at the uh, Old Bailey can only accommodate two defendants. Uh, the overflow court wasn't visible to the defendants. And the defendant's view of the main courtroom uh, didn't give a clear image of the face of anyone on the screen. And uh, if it was unfair to conduct the trial with the defendants by a live link, then the solutions are pretty limited and uh, none of them very attractive. The first was the governor would have to vary his policy. Um, and uh, uh, the prisons have been extremely successful in limiting. Uh, the number of uh, coronavirus cases in custody because of the very strict measures that they have uh, introduced uh, in order to um, keep the inmates and prison officers safe. Uh, so uh, that, that wouldn't be attractive at all, varying the policy. The second option is the trial would have to be adjourned, but until when? And the last option would be the defendants would be granted bail. Uh, again, not an attractive option. Anyway, Mr. Justice Aegis, a very, very experienced criminal um, judge, um, came up with two solutions. So if we move on to the next slide, please. The first one was he held that the court had power under its inherent jurisdiction to direct that defendants should attend the trial, other than when they were giving evidence, by appearing in the virtual court at Belmarsh. And that extended to allowing the proceedings to be relayed to locations other than the main courtroom where the judge and jury were sitting so that those who had an interest in the proceedings could view them. And those other locations were, uh, for all purposes, extensions of the courtroom. And the second solution, if we move on to the next slide, please, um, uh, is the most important one, I think, because um, Mr Justice Edis, uh, uh looked in detail at the wording of the legislation in section 51 of the Criminal Justice Act and uh, construed it in such a way as to enable the defendants to take place by video link. Now I'm not going to read out all those definitions again but the, the, the key point is that um, uh, there's a list in sub subsection 3 of the people participating in eligible criminal proceedings uh, so those are the people that um, have to be seen, see and be seen and heard, obviously, on a live video link. Um, and we see in subsection 2D the definition of live video link that Lara, Lana referred to earlier. So if we, if we move on to the next slide, um, what Mr Justice Edis held was that the par people, the participant, the legislation refers to as P, in this case it's the defendants, must be able to see and hear are the participants listed in uh, section 56 subsection 3, um, others in closely comparable positions but not everybody attending the proceedings and the same people have to be able to hear and see P. But and this is the critical bit, at any particular moment in time the minimum requirements for a lawful live video link were that P must be able to see and hear all the people listed in section 56 subsection 3 and those in comparable positions while they are saying something which is intended to be a contribution to the proceedings and, and that's really the most important message that uh, you don't have to be able to hear and see everybody all the time uh, only uh, when somebody is uh, saying something which is intended to be a contribution to the proceedings 
as far as the jury is concerned, uh, their participation doesn't generally involve speaking, so the equipment just has to be capable of showing them to be the P, the defendants, and enabling the defendants to hear anything that they might say. And uh, the equipment should be used to focus on the person who is addressing the court um, at any one time because that's more conducive to fairness because the defendant or P can see the person like you can see Lana and I quite close up uh, rather than having a view of the whole courtroom where everybody's very small and you can't uh, see faces and expressions properly. And uh, moving on to the last slide, please. Um, Mr Justice Edith said that each individual defendant's position had to be considered separately and he concluded uh, that it was in the interest of justice to make a live link direction under section 51 in respect of each defendant in that case although it has not been without its uh, hiccups because um, on the second day of the trial um, Belmarsh's um, technology uh, collapsed and um, uh, I think he, he, the defendants had to be produced at court on one day, but I think they are now continuing with the defendants on a video link. So, um, thank you. Uh, we've got to the end of our PowerPoint presentation. Um, I think I've dealt with uh, two questions that came up during the course um, of Lana's half. And um, there's a it says comment more than a question up at the moment, which I haven't managed to read. Lana, do you have any thoughts on that? So we've, um, I've, I've managed to answer some of the questions that have been posted while you've been talking, Alice, as well. So um, one that I wanted to run past you, though, I don't have any objections to anybody using headphones. Have you had any problems with that? Heard any problems about it? Um, no. And in fact, uh, it's quite common for people to use headphones. Yeah, I, I think it's perfectly sensible. Um, there's one question about whether any consideration has been given to using perspex screens in court so that you could potentially sit jurors a bit closer together. I know we've ordered some at Harrow and they've turned up and they're defective, which has been very <laughs> um, um Yes, it, it is possible. And I think um, uh, the resident judge at one of the courts up north, Guy Curl, I can't remember which court it is. I don't know Lana, um, has this week just started doing jury trials for the first time with perspex screens between the jurors and so um, we're interested to see how that has worked out. Um, I'm told that uh, quite soon after lockdown the price of perspex rocketed <laughs> um, which um, <laughs> is, is not ideal. Um, it's certainly an option that some people are considering. Uh, there are some courtrooms, um, two that I'm aware of in the South Eastern Circuit, where the rooms are, are so small that it's not possible to conduct a jury trial at all. Oh, uh, Harrow, we've only got two courtrooms that are large enough. Two out of our eight courtrooms are large enough to get 12 jurors, two counsel and a judge in. Yeah, but I think three of ours are. Um, and so, uh, active bit consideration that is being given in some courts to um, perspex being used but then you've also uh, got air circulation problems haven't you so um, I know we've got no opening windows um, and I think if you're going to use screens you've possibly got further problems with air circulation yeah I hadn't thought of that that's a good point I don't know and um, Henry Grumwald, Grumwald is asking um, and I bet you'd like the answer to this question. When we can expect any realistic proposals about larger, longer, multi-handed trials? Well, um, I think we all recognise um, that they are uh, uh, the challenge of the moment um, and uh, active and serious consideration is being given to how we can deal with that. Um, I mentioned in one of my slides the possibility of defendants being spread across two courts. So one in the trial courtroom, one in the, uh, some in the overflow courtroom, and then swapping round from time to time as appropriate. Um, that's, that's being seriously considered. Um, the uh, PEX contractors are considering how best to, um, uh, or, or how they can implement the latest government advice 
about social distancing because obviously we've moved from two meters to one meter plus with precautions and if you actually read the government's advice um the the written advice that was produced um on friday two weeks ago it, it doesn't tell you exactly what you can do but it has a, a list of examples of precautionary measures and uh, sadly very few of them are practical for jury trials but one, one of the ones that is is the use of face masks and i think active consideration is being given to the extent to which um distancing within the dock can be reduced uh, if face masks are used the um these are just ideas that are being considered at the moment and i'm not aware that any definite decisions have been taken about them um uh, but um we uh, have now listed some two-handed trials um to take place in um august and i'm due to start a three-handed case at the end of august which i hope we will be able to um accommodate um at that stage but it, it's a it's a difficult question and um if anybody has any bright ideas uh, <laughs> speak now well and the other the other public facing aspect about it is if we're asking members of the public to come in and perform their duty as jurors we have to be confident that we're providing them with a safe space to do that in and they have to be absolutely yeah in order that they can concentrate and, and um, turn their minds to the issues in the case um, absolutely yeah sorry i was just going to say that uh, the, that the jurors are all sent a questionnaire before their jury service begins asking a whole load of relevant covid related questions to identify whether they have um that they're in a category which means they shouldn't be coming to court or for other reasons they have concerns about coming to court and um so people in that situation are not asked to come they're excused uh, but we still have um happily uh, enough jurors uh, with you know and it's not I, I hesitate to say plenty but sufficient um so that that is addressed and one of the things that we do when they first the jury panel first comes the judge first speaks to them is we explain all of the measures that have been put in place and if their name is called uh, then they're given an opportunity to express any concern that they might have about those arrangements or um, uh, reasons they feel they shouldn't sit and i'm happy to say uh, that so far and i think we we've done four jury trials now um once we got to that stage, nobody has expressed any concerns, so that's good. Yeah. Uh, um, there's, I think, one final question from Max Popovsky, um, saying, um, "Well, did we have security concerns about using third-party software?" I have to say, my attitude whenever um, the people raise concerns about the possibility of people listening in to um, Skype hearings or other types of video hearings was these are public hearings if anybody listens in why is it a problem but I know other members of the judiciary are more concerned than I was and I'm sure nobody would have wanted to end up with somebody sharing content in the middle of their hearing did you hear of any problems no I uh, no I, I haven't uh, there, there has been uh, some concern um, that uh, defendants who are on bail who participate through um, a video hearing might uh, surreptitiously um, record um, video or audio content and then share it for example on social media but I'm not aware of that ever having happened um, but it, it's something that can be managed in the sense that um, you know from the case one has a pretty good idea of what sort of defendant you're dealing with and the judge can make a decision as to whether or not it's appropriate for them to appear by a live link or whether they should be required to attend court in person <laughs> did you see that last question it's disappeared. Okay, yes, I, I've just answered it. I'm afraid I answered it by saying, why not ask to come and do some marshalling? 
Um, yes, that's a very good idea. We've had quite a few marshals come from Grey's um, to Harrow. Um, both Rosa Dean and I are um, Grey's members, and I know you have them at, at Croydon as well. Um, I did marshalling when I was um, doing my bar school year and found it really inspiring. Yeah, I, I did too. I, I went to Teesside and sat with um, Mr. Ju well, well, then he was Mr. Justice Glidewell, so he later became Lord Justice Glidewell when he was uh, presider of the circuit. And I was there for two weeks while he did two very interesting cases. And uh, it, I agree, it was uh, invaluable. And not only is it really inspiring in terms of if you want, might want to have a judicial career further down the line, but also seeing how things look from the judge's side of the bench at that earlier stage in your career, I am sure makes you a better advocate. No, I agree with that. Good. I think we've got to the end of the questions, Alice. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Lana, um, for fielding all those. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, everybody. Um, I hope you found that useful. Um, it's uh, uh, these are challenging times for the criminal justice system, and uh, the judiciary very much appreciate uh, all of the uh, hard work that uh, everybody has put into helping our staff, uh, advocates, um, and uh, everyone who's keeping um, keeping it going. So keep up the good work, everybody. <laughs>